Hello, and welcome back to the Bee Yard. Here in Michigan, the fall is over and the winter snow is just around the corner. As we prepare our beehives for the winter, we definitely want to make sure that the hives have proper winter ventilation. As a living, breathing superorganism, the colony will generate a lot of moisture through the respiration, and we want to make sure that all of this moisture has a place to go. And the best place for it to go is outside of the hive. Unless there is a means for this moisture to escape, it will condense on the inner cover and drip back down on the winter cluster. This is a near, surefire way to kill your bees. There are a number of ways to deal with wintertime moisture in the hive, each with its pluses and minuses. Some beekeepers drill a hole in front, near the top of the hive. This works fine, except you need to make sure, as you shuffle the hive bodies at the end of the season, that the top hive body is the one with the hole. Also, I suppose it is possible that rain and snow can blow into the hole since it is generally below the bottom of the telescoping cover. Other beekeepers cut a notch on the lower edge of the inner cover. This approach also works and the notch will, will be protected from the elements by the telescoping top cover. I like to use emery shims. These gadgets are three quarter inch rims that have a notch cut into the front edge. An emery shim can be located anywhere in the hive stack throughout the season, but having one just below the inner cover is a good way to get rid of wintertime moisture. Yet another method is to use hive top ventilation shims, which is the subject of this video. The shims have a wedged shaped taper with the front end being about three quarter inch high. Using a hive top shim is simplicity itself. You simply place the shims along the side of the hive bodies, just below the inner cover. These hive top ventilation shims have several things going for them. First, they are simple and inexpensive to build. All you need are three quarter inch boards that are about 20 inches long. You probably have some scrap pieces in your shop that will do the job. Second, the front of the inner cover will be raised about three quarters inch above the hive body and will, will create a long gap across the front of the hive. This provides lots and lots of ventilation space and this gap will be under the telescoping top cover so it will be protected from the elements. Third, the taper of the shims will make the inner cover slanted toward the back. This slant will cause any condensing moisture, and there will be some, to run toward the back and then down along the back side. The cluster will be protected from the constant drips, which can result from flat line inner covers. Fourth, these shims are quick to install. All you do is pop off the two top covers, place the shims on the top of the hive, and then put everything back together. The whole operation can be done easily in under a minute. While cutting a wedge shaped shim may seem to be a simple operation, there's actually a bit more to it than meets the eye. So we invite you to join us as we learn how to make hive top ventilation shims in the beekeepers workshop. Let's take a closer look at a hive top ventilation shim. As we saw, the shims are located on the sides of the topmost hive body, directly underneath the inner cover and the top cover. The shims are 19 and 7 eighths inches long and taper from 3 quarter inch in the front down to about an eighth of an inch in the back. At first glance, cutting a wedge shaped shim might seem to be a simple job. But as we said before, there's a bit more to it, starting with just how do you make a tapered cut on a table saw. The key is to use a taper jig, which will hold the board at the proper angle as you run it through your table saw. The taper jig is the only safe way to make this type of cut. So we will start this project by making a taper jig. It is not complicated. Once you have the jig made, cutting the shims is simple. The first shim is cut using the taper jig, adjusted for the three-quarter inch height of the shim. 
The second shim is made without the taper jig, using only the fence of the, taper saw, of the table saw. These two operations are then repeated for as many pair of shims as you need. So in today's project, we will start by making a taper jig. Along the way, we will also show you, show you a couple of shop tips that will come in handy in this and other workshop projects. Let's get started. The taper jig is simply two 1x4 boards that are hinged together on one end. The hinge will allow us to spread the arms of the jig to get the degree of taper we need for the job at hand. On the back of the jig, there is a spreader bracket that can be tightened to the arms, keeping the angle of the jig where we want it to be. Finally, there is a stop block on the outside arm near the back. The stop block will push the board we are using for the shims as we make the cut on the table saw. There is considerable leeway when making taper jigs, the most obvious being the length of each arm. We are going with 30 inches which is plenty long for the hive top shims and will be long enough for other shop projects which may come our way. You never know. First, we need to cut two 1x4 boards to a length of 30 inches. Then clamp the sides together, making sure the ends are flush, and attach a 2-inch box hinge on one end. The spreader bracket is tightened to the side arms by two quarter inch bolts, one in each arm. This means that we need something in each arm into which we can screw the bolts. We do this with a gadget called a threaded insert. A threaded insert is a small barrel shaped fastening device that has thin threads on the outside that will screw into the pilot hole. The insert is also threaded on the inside to accept the size of bolt we are using. Threaded inserts come in a variety of sizes and styles and are available at your local hardware store or online through woodworking catalogs. To install a threaded insert, we first need to drill an oversized pilot hole on the edge of the jig arm one inch from the end opposite the hinge. For a quarter inch insert, this pilot hole is three eighths of an inch in diameter. The depth of the hole needs to be about the length of the bolt you are using or the length of the threaded insert, whichever is greater. To make the pilot holes, I am using a drill press with a Fossner bit. The Fossner bit gives me a clean bore with a flat bottom. Also notice that I have clamped a couple of pieces of scrap to the size of the jig arm to prevent splitting while the hole is drilled. Now that our holes are drilled, we have to install the threaded inserts. So how do we do that? Well, one way is to make a simple tool from a bolt with a couple of nuts screwed onto the shank. Since our threaded insert is sized for a quarter inch, I took a quarter inch bolt, inch and a half long, and screwed on two nuts, exposing about a half inch or so of the threads. The nuts allow us to tighten the bolt up against the threaded insert. Now you can use a nut driver or a socket wrench to carefully screw in the threaded insert. Make sure the insert is screwed in straight. Here is a shop tip that will make installing the threaded insert even easier by using your drill press. 
Cut the head off of a quarter inch bolt and install the two stop nuts just like we did before. And screw the headless bolt into the insert. Now chuck this whole affair into your drill press. While lowering the drill with one hand, turn the chuck with the other and slowly screw the insert until it is flush with the board. Using a drill press will ensure you have the insert installed straight each and every time and no cross threading. This technique is particularly useful when installing a threaded insert into hardwood, such as oak or maple. Next, we need a small stop block on the front side of the arm, one and a half inches from the end opposite the hinge. From strap one by four, cut a short piece one and one half inches wide. Glue and nail the stop to the outside arm, making sure that the stop is square to the side of the board. Finally, we need to make the spreader bracket. From scratch quarter inch hardboard, cut a piece two inches wide and eight inches long. A nice feature is to round over the ends of the spreader bracket. To make the round ends, mark a one inch radius circle on each end. I'm using a gauge I printed on a 3D printer. Then cut along this line. You can use a jigsaw or a bandsaw if you have one. Clean up any rough edges with sandpaper. On the bracket, there is a quarter inch wide channel down the middle. On the center line of the bracket, one inch from the end, drill a quarter inch pilot hole. Drill this pilot hole on both ends of the bracket. Then use a jigsaw to cut along the inside of guidelines along the top and bottom of the channel. Our taper jig is now done. When assembling the jig, use quarter inch washers underneath each bolt. Notice that I am using knobbed bolts, which makes loosening and tightening the spreader easier than just with a standard bolt although a standard bolt would work just as well too. Let's take another quick look at the shim. It is 19 and 7 8 inches long, 3 quarter inch on the wide side, and 1 8 inch on the thin end. The taper jig has to be set up correctly to get the shim the way we want. Since we start cutting the shim at the 1 8 inch thin end, the total rise has to be 5 8 of an inch over the length of the shim. The simplest way to get this angle is to strike a reference mark 19 and 7 8 inches from the hinged end. Then adjust the arm of the jig so that there is a 5 8 inch gap at this mark. There, our taper jig is ready to go. Now we need to set the fence. Again, let's look at the shim. The thin end of the shim is an 8 inch thick. With the taper jig, you always start the cut at the thin end and work your way back to the wide end. This means that the saw's fence has to be adjusted so that the board extends 1 8 inch beyond the outside of the blade. Although you can set the fence by eyeball, getting a consistent 1 8 inch spacing is hard to do. Here's another shop tip that will allow you to get it right each and every time. In the miter gauge track, insert a tight fitting strip of wood. I'm using a scrap piece of oak which I keep on hand for just this purpose. Then using your combination square, drop in an eighth inch drill bit against the wood strip and the base of the square and slide the ruler up against the blade's kerf. Tighten the ruler at this spot. Now when the drill bit is removed, the end of the ruler is exactly one eighth inch away from the outside of the blade. To set the fence, lay in the stock you are using for the shims. Adjust the fence so that the end of the board is tied up against the combo square's ruler. Clamp the fence in place and you're ready to go. Okay. 
The taper jig is at the right angle and the fence is in the right spot. Looks like we are ready to start to make the shims. I'm starting with a 1x8 cut to a length of 19 and 7 8 inches. The 1x8 is plenty wide to safely make several sets of shims without getting too close to the blade. Notice that with the taper jig in place, the board is at an angle. The thin end of the shim will be cut first, as always, with the cut tapering back to the wide end of the shim. To make the first shim, simply slide the board and jig together along the saw's fence. After the first shim is cut, the board now has a tapered side. So to make the second shim, we don't need the taper jig. All we need to do is to make a rip cut using just the saw's fence. Adjust the fence using the combo square to get the spacing right, just like we did before. And run it through to make the second shim. And there you have it, two hive top ventilation shims that are close enough to being identical. Notice that our stock board now has parallel sides. So to make more shims, we simply repeat what we just did. Cut the first shim with the taper jig and the second one without the jig. While you are at it, you might as well go ahead and cut several sets of shims. Give some away to your beekeeping buddies or take them to your local bee club to share with others. Be sure to always provide lots of ventilation to your beehives during the winter. And today's project for hive top ventilation shims is a good way to do it. Today we have also learned how to make ventilation shims using a taper jig. I bet you will find more uses for this handy gadget in the beekeepers workshop.